Kibo? interest in mm. painting has led me on a rather strange journey over the years and I'm pleased to say that uh, I feel very welcome here in Singapore because a couple of years ago I had the very great fortune to contribute to an exhibition here at the Art Science Museum in Singapore and that exhibition was titled Dinosaurs Dawn to Extinction. Mm. So um, the good friends here in Singapore Science Centre uh, have invited me back with my colleagues Patricia Pickers Rich here and Dr. Tom Rich mm. uh, to talk a little bit about the sorts of collaborations that we have done as scientists, paleontologists in particular, and myself as an artist and an illustrator. This is an interesting story from the point of view of the fact that we're actually not necessarily thinking so much about the future but trying to actually reconstruct the past. And myself as an artist, uh, have been an integral part of that. So we want to talk a little bit about that during the course of this coming week uh, through a series of talks and also uh, discuss uh, some of the things we're doing with a bit of hands-on experience at, at some workshops. So this is the sort of illustration that I did several decades ago and this is the sort of product that we have been involved in producing and this sort of illustration is very well known and widespread uh, used throughout the world. So when you're looking at some of the work that we've done, there's several questions that I'd like you guys to think about. Um, but I'm not actually going to answer those questions. These will become fairly obvious to you and apparent in the course of what we're doing over the next uh, few days. I'm not going to, as I said, answer those questions. I'm going to ask a couple of very simple questions. First of all, who am I? I guess, like most little kids, I had wonderful fantasies about adversarial foes, um, which I was going to annihilate using my water gun. But like most children, uh, and I was watching this outside actually yesterday as the kids were playing in the courtyard here. Mm. And for me, something must have gone tragically wrong with my childhood because I became an artist instead. <laughs> a particular sort of artist in actual fact. I'm someone who had the good fortune of being steeped in the traditional figurative art of European mm. culture. So I ended up developing some very old time skills. I paint portraits. I learnt to paint portraits. And that's an example of one of those portraits there. I'm very interested in the visual mode. That's my game and um, you'd be uh, interested to see how I hook in all those other senses through a very old time traditional method of just simple visual uh, skills. I'm very interested in the pattern of life, the pattern of visual life, how that reflects in social structure, and understanding, also interested in... <coughs> visual information in the natural world, how that changes over time, through seasons, and so forth. That sort of interest in detailed structure in the visual field has led me to get more and more involved in that experience. This is a painting of a cliff face. And as you always realise that there are incredible amounts of detail information to be found here. Cracks, faults, the mistakes of nature, the things that are left over, and how that mix reflects upon the landscape that we know and travel through and have to survive from. And that's a typical example of a traditional landscape painting. But as you look at that, the vignette you realise in the middle is looking down at the ground. The landscape through the horizon is a particular shape. All of those features tell a story about the transition and the experiences of the Earth over a long period of time. Those flat top hills in the background there 
um, a limestone, limestone layers. Those layers were actually laid down in the Cambrian some 500 million years ago and are representing the hard parts of the very first animals who learned, um, who evolved biomineralisation. In the foreground, those strange impressions of the rocks are actually fossils of soft bodied organisms. Hmm. This brings me to a new branch of science that actually has only been around since the middle of the, of the last century, and that's the paleontology of the Ediacaran period. This is the time in Earth's history where animals evolved the transition from, from uh, single-celled organisms through to multi-celled organisms. And I've become involved with that, particularly through uh, the interests of Pat and her research work. The next simple question I'm going to answer for you is how did we meet? This strange little, almost unfathomable little object here is the remains of a large extinct mammal skull. It's only a fragment of it. And we got together in the early days because Tom in particular was looking for someone who could do visual jigsaw puzzles. Literally put pieces of fragmentary evidence from the fossil record together to make a hole, a three-dimensional hole. I could do this in part through two-dimensional representation, which is my traditional skill, but that was done as part of the search project so that we could actually understand what these remains actually represented. Little was I to know that as time advanced and Tom's interest focused more and more on the evolution of, and the origin of mammals from the Mesozoic, I was going to be confronted with them trying to put these little jigsaw puzzles mm, mm, mm. together, <laughs> almost in micro form. Well. So suddenly from my great visual grand views of the landscape, I'm looking down the barrel of a 3D microscope and trying to put all these minuscule fragments. That's a tiny jaw of a mammal, mouse-sized animal, but that's 110 million years old. What on earth was it? It scurried around the feet of dinosaurs, perhaps. But as time's gone on, of course, technology's clicked in big time. We're now using all sorts of scanning technology to, to produce digital renderings of these small objects in order to try and understand and piece together how they are. So suddenly my simple jigsaw puzzle is now turning into a three-dimensional effort using scan technology. This is another mammal jaw from the same period of time. Uh, it represents perhaps one of the earliest uh, known representatives of the monotremes. That's the animals that are related to the echidna and platypus in Australia today. So from those sorts of images, I'm still doing my traditional two-dimensional representation of 3D. We do can do visual animations, but of course the digital information is in interesting and important because we can actually make large things small, small things large. We can actually look at things inside the rock before we've actually tried to excavate them. And we can look at things in three dimensions and animate the whole lot. So my traditional skills are being tested and challenged and re-employed to do yet harder and harder tasks as we develop the technology to see into the past more and more and more. So when you come to exhibitions like the Dinosaurs Dawn to Extinction exhibition and you see these massive skeletons of prehistoric creatures all assembled and displayed in lifelike postures, you realise very easily that this is actually a very time consuming and very detailed task to put this information together. This is usually what we're dealing with. Drawers and drawers of museum cabinets full of scraps of bones and crushed artifacts. Everything's distorted, everything's in pieces, and everything has to be put together. So my role as an illustrator, of course, actually has a time component to it. There's hundreds of years, in some cases, of scientific study that goes into the assimilation of what I have to put together. Traditional drawing skills are employed. I can visualise 3D structures and reassemble the entire animals on the basis of their skeleton. I'm involved in <coughs> simple traditional three-dimensional sculpture and model making to visualise what I'm seeing and trying to understand from the record. Simple sketches like that are then composed 
and finally, I'll end up with a visual image of a particular situation or an event. This leads to the next sort of question as to how I can really be employed in this process. So as you see, some of it is simply jigsaw puzzle, turning information into complete information and then taking that information and even perhaps anticipating, extrapolating and theorising. So one of the major roles of what I do is to actually bring together ideas and represent ideas in a very simple form that people can immediately understand and comprehend and contemplate. So why, after all that effort, did I actually reconstruct a dead dinosaur? There's several reasons for it. The fossil record is very incomplete. We know a lot about certain things and very little, almost nothing about other things. So the information that I deal with is patchy. It can't necessarily always be combined into a visual whole. The situation is nothing unusual. Animals die. Actually, that's how we know about the past. Nature's not efficient. Bits and pieces of it get preserved. Not everything decays. So part of my involvement of getting people to understand very, very complicated scientific information is to actually simplify it to the point where it's very easy to both visually and emotionally enter into the things that we're describing. Everyone can visualise the stench of that poor animal that died in the deserts of Central Australia. It's nothing different to the animal that we were looking at. It's the same experience, except this is 100 million years before we were conscious enough to be able to think about it in this way. But part of the story is to actually tell how these animals were preserved and why they've come down to us through the ages. So every little feature, every little scrap of rubbish in that illustration is actually related to bits and pieces of the environment that were preserved right alongside that partial skeleton. So when you look at this illustration, that strange little split leaf there is a part of a deciduous plant. That's the ancestors of the ginkgo tree. They used to grow in Australia at that time. This strange little ridge scrap of bone. That's how we know there are lungfish in this environment. They survive in isolated places in South America, Africa and Australia. Down here, a scrap of tooth. It's the same type of tooth that that small dinosaur. That's how we know there are other dinosaurs that were closely related living in this sort of environment. This was to introduce people to the detective work that goes on. Not to just be, wow, there's a huge, big, fierce dinosaur, blood dripping from its teeth. Isn't that scary and wonderful? And it's very, very wonderful for children because it's safe. It can't be threatened. But that's only part of the scientific process. Part of the scientific process is to actually look, study, and think about things in minuscule detail and actually try and find out how this all fits together. So this simple painting was simply exploring that concept. The concept went further. We started to get ideas about what was happening in the environment. Where we work in Australia, um, the dinosaur fossils that we discover and excavate from the rocks, at the time those rocks were formed, this is an area of land that was below the Antarctic Circle. So we're dealing with an environment, which you think of dinosaurs as perhaps a warm, hothouse environment. We're dealing with an environment at the poles. The landscape there may have been very different. The environment and the temperature uh, and climate may have been very different. It certainly would have been dark for three months of the year. How did the massive forests that were there survive? How were the dinosaurs challenged? This gives us answers about the physiology of some of these animals and um, how they may have in fact interacted with the environment. So this tells us a lot about the past. So this is part of the reason why we want to explore some of these unusual situations. So that's a theoretical illustration, to visualise what Pat and Tom have been thinking. Could these dinosaurs survive there? We don't know what sort of integument these animals had. Did they have scales and skin? Did they have proto-feathers? Were they insulated? Were they warm-blooded? Were they cold-blooded? All of these questions are right at the forefront of their minds. So how do I illustrate that in a way that invites you to go down that same path of inquiry? One aspect of Pat's work is to do with the evolution of large flightless birds in Australia. And this particular illustration was designed as the cover piece for a 
350-page book des describing and, and discussing the paleontology of this extinct group of flightless birds. So part of my issue is to actually bring you totally up close and personal to what we understand about these animals, their anatomy, their possible biology, their appearance in some respects. So that's part of the detailed portrait knowledge I can throw into the mix of what I do. Um, that strange piece there is also a, a fossil impression from the rocks in Namibia. Hmm. One of Pat's interests, uh, which has had me fascinated for a long time now, is the Ediacaran period of time. This is the time in which, as I said before, hmm. animals became complex. This is the time when animals became large. And this is the time that Darwin certainly didn't know about at the time he wrote his amazing book on the origin of species. Hmm. One of the things that I've become involved with, in addition to my visual skills, is to actually apply those right throughout the process of discovery. Hmm. So Pat and I have visited these sites from Australia and Russia and Namibia and also in Newfoundland to look at the rocks and try and find all the different ways in which these soft-bodied organisms were preserved, some of which were only preserved as, pre as impressions. I'm used to dealing with hard structures, skeletons, muscle tissues, uh, comparative anatomy, knowing how animals work and function uh, and are formed today. A lot of those ideas go out the window when we start getting that far back in the evolutionary story of this planet. So we're looking at strange little clayey, sandy rock layers in the sediments and mapping where we find these soft fossils. So I'm doing conceptual diagrams, I'm doing maps, I'm doing all sorts of things to try and illustrate how we actually reconstruct what we are attempting to understand from this period of time. So that's a little gutter, a little slurry that happened uh, on the continental shelf below the sea at the time and it swept a whole lot of these um, bottom dwelling organisms down with it and buried them in the sludge. That's a record of that little gutter, that little channel, all those little red dots down here are specimens. So that entire block was smashed open and all the specimens excavated and studied. Hmm. So then I'm starting to use other means by which I can uncover these. We can break the rocks open and we're starting to look at the biochemistry because we now realise that all these organisms are preserved in sulphur compounds, fine layers of, of pyrite that separate the layers of sand in which they're formed. So we're thinking about how these things are decaying, why they're decaying in the way they are, and perhaps what the original biomaterial was that they were made from. We're cutting the rocks and slicing them open and doing thin sections and studying the grains of sand and the sediment. We're also looking at this particular area because we're starting to find these specimens not just preserved as imprints, external moulds of their body form at the time, but we're realising that they're actually preserved in three dimensions as well. So we're also now using scanning technologies to actually look into the rocks uh, to discover those sorts of things. And so it goes on. Just diagrams of traditional research papers illustrating what we're seeing and explaining uh, how we're interpreting these organisms. And then I finally come up with an illustration such as that. It's a cutaway diagram, if you like, uh, of what we think the body structure of these organisms were. We're suddenly finding out that this is a hexaradial symmetrical animal. The body plans of a lot of these organisms are totally unfamiliar to us today. We've been looking at this period because we think we're going to find the origin of modern animals, things like arthropods, things like sponges, things like mm. jellyfish and medusa. And we are finding them, but we're also finding something we didn't expect to find. We're finding this group of organisms which doesn't exist anymore. It was one of life's first experiments on how to grow big. So this is a cutaway diagram of what we think is the soft tissue skeleton. It remains a total enigma to us. We don't know how this organism worked. We don't know what its rest of its soft tissues were made of and how it fed. 
Clearly it had a large surface area to volume ratio and was perhaps filtering things out of the water column. But it was embedded in the mud and we know that these animals, while they were alive, actually incorporated sand grains into the base of their body structure. Some mm. organisms today do that, like sand dollars, but we are now finding that this entire group of organisms was, seems to have been very adept at doing this. So we're actually right on the edge of a mystery in one of the life's earliest experiments at the time. And I can put together landscape views. So if you can imagine a 550 million year old submarine and a flash gun, maybe that's what these animals looked like as they lived on the bed of the sea uh, well below the photic zone. And you can see that there is a diversity of structures there. These animals are all made from the same basic fractal form, one element then repeated in series to produce the structure. Depending on the combination uh, of those elements, we end up with different forms. And they obviously exploited the environment in slightly different ways. So we're starting to see the evolutionary story starting here, uh, showing competition between these organisms, a competition over the water column height and the minerals that were dissolved in the sea at that time, and also competition for area. You can see there the ripple patterns which we've got preserved uh, in the sediments in which these organisms are found, uh, the bacterial mats that used to actually cover the basis of the, the base of the seabed at the time. And these sorts of environments only now exist in extreme conditions, either in the, in the deep sea plains or in the hot uh, volcanic vents at the bottom of the sea plains. And lately I've become involved, so involved with some of the mammal work. Remember that strange lump of specimen that Tom first asked me to reconstruct for him? I've been looking at more of these large uh, marsupial animals from Australia. And this is uh, my illustrative reconstruction of the skull of one of these beasts. We're interested in this animal because it appeared to have been a marsupial that actually was as large as a tapir. It actually had an open skull. The front of the nose of this animal was extremely uh, exposed and it may have in fact had a trunk exactly like a tapir. And I've just done a PhD project actually describing the anatomy of this animal for the first time. Hmm. Um, and reconstructing both the, skull, the skeleton, uh, the skull in this particular case, and now I can start to play with the soft tissue anatomy. And through comparative anatomy, I can start to make estimations of things like the uh, soft tissue structure that form the cartilage bridge of the septum of the nose, uh, the cartilage that formed the nostrils of the animal, and then the layers of muscles that operate in the jaws. And so you go on. This is the process that I actually use to build dinosaurs. <coughs> and the fascinating thing about this process is I don't actually know what I'm going to end up with when I start. So in a sense, the imaginative component of this is not present at the very beginning of the exercise. It grows along with the research that I do in the course of doing that. So at the end of the day, maybe I have a portrait of something that I never knew existed in this visual form before. So I'll conclude my talk here just to give you a flavour of how I, as a visual artist, um, have become involved in science, paleontological science in particular. I also mm. do lots of other aspects of science as well. But this is part of what I've been uh, happily employed doing for quite some time. So thank you for your time today. And uh, I'll say the end. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Peter, for giving us an insight into the reconstruction that happens with this fossil.